So much of the global economy has been immobilized by the COVID-19 response and by the fact that 65% of the oil used in the world is used for transportation. So for jet fuel or for our cars or buses or other modes of transportation. So when everyone ends up being under lockdown, nobody's going anywhere and the demand for oil plummeted appropriately. Dr. Megan O'Sullivan. She is the Jean Kirkpatrick Professor of the Practice of International Affairs and the Director of Geopolitics of Energy Project at Harvard University's Kennedy School. She is also the chair of the North American Group of the Tri Trilateral Commission. Her third book, Windfall, How the New Energy Abundance Upends Global Politics and Strengthens America's Power, was published by Simon & Schuster in September 2017. Dr. O'Sullivan has extensive experience in policy and in negotiation. From uh, July 2013 to December 13, uh, 2013, she was the vice chair of the All Party Talks in Northern Ireland. Between 2004 and 2007, she was president, president George W. Bush and deputy national security advisor for Iraq and Afghanistan. She's on the board of Raytheon Technologies and the board of the Council on Foreign Relations. She's also a member of the International Advisory Group for the British law firm Linklaters, a columnist for Bloomberg Opinion, a consultant to energy companies, and a senior advisor at West Exec Advisors. Um, she has written several books and many articles on international affairs. She has been awarded the Defense Department's Honor for the Distinguished Medal and three times has been awarded the Department's Superior Honor Award. Uh, Dr. O'Sullivan earned a degree from a Master of Science in Economics and Doctorate in Politics from Oxford University. And fun fact, uh, she is originally from our corner of the world, Lexington, Massachusetts. So welcome, Dr. O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Mary. And thanks to the World Affairs Council in Boston for hosting this event and for WGBH for um, helping make it reach as many people as we can. Um, I'd like to welcome all of your members from across the country and I say I'm excited to speak with you today about um, uh, uh, outgrowth of the COVID-19 crisis, one that um, I think if it were happening in any other circumstance would be receiving enormous amounts of attention because it is historic and unprecedented in its scope. Um, but it's part of this larger crisis, which is, is, has even greater implications for humanity. Um, I think most people will have seen the, the broad numbers that we're seeing this basically an unprecedented collapse in the oil markets, that we saw the price of oil go down by about two thirds from January until the middle of April. Um, again, going uh, down from kind of a, a healthy price to a price that at least in the United States actually turned negative. We saw a couple of days where it was actually for US producers, there was a negative price, meaning that essentially producers would be paying others to take away um, their oil. Now, in addition to that, this oil crisis has a lot of geopolitical implications. So what I'd like to say in my opening comments, I'll um, give, uh, I'll talk for a bit about the collapse in the market, the cause of it, the response, and what we might expect in the future. And then I'll spend a little bit of time on some of the geopolitical implications, which I know will be of interest to your viewership and leave plenty of time for questions because there's a lot to talk about and I want to get at the issues that are of most interest to your viewers. Um, so first, the cause of the oil crash. Now, it's important to keep in mind that what we saw, um, what, what precipitated this massive collapse in the oil market was the combination of a supply shock and a demand shock. Um, so I'll say a little bit about each and really the important thing is to keep them both in perspective. So first, the supply shock. In March, um, early March, March 7th, we had a meeting between Saudi Arabia, other members of OPEC, and Russia and other members of the oil producing world that were not officially members of OPEC but had been coordinating with OPEC over the last several years about uh, restraining production to keep prices high enough in an overall oil market where um, 
you, you had a lot of new actors, including the United States. So at the time, on March 7th, Saudi Arabia said to Russia and others, we need to cut production by about one and a half million barrels of oil because of the drop in demand that we're seeing from China. Because at that point, the effect of the coronavirus on the Chinese economy was was evident, although it wasn't yet evident on the rest of the world. So the sense was a supply cut of a one and a half million barrels might be sufficient to restore balance to the market. Russia, for a variety of reasons we could go into, said it wasn't interested in cutting production anymore. And this ended kind of an era of cooperation among all of these producers where Russia walked out of the meeting and <clears throat> its oil minister said, everybody should feel free to produce as much oil as they want. And this really catalyzed um, a pretty aggressive move on the part of many producers, but most prominently Saudi Arabia, which uh, proceeded to put on the market an additional two and a half million barrels of oil. And to give you some context, they had been producing about 10, so another 25% of production on the market. And Russia was planning on doing the same and other producers were doing the same. So you got more oil pushed onto the global market at a time you know, when demand was not strong and was weakening. So that's the supply shock. The demand shock, however, is so much bigger than that supply shock. Um, if I think about the supply shock as being two to four million barrels of oil a day, the demand drop um, for April was believed to be around 30 million barrels of oil a day. And that is a third of global oil demand. So in February, if the world was consuming 100 million barrels of oil a day, in April, that was down by 30 million barrels, by 30%. Um, this, again, I use the word unprecedented. There's never been a time in the history of oil where demand has dropped by anything remotely close to this. Um, and this, of course, is not surprising when we think about how so much of the global economy has been immobilized by the COVID-19 response and by the fact that 65% of the oil used in the world is used for transportation. So for jet fuel or for our cars or buses or other modes of transportation. So when everyone ends up being under lockdown, nobody's going anywhere and the demand for oil plummeted appropriately. Now, the reason I ask you to keep the supply and the demand shock in perspective is that we would have a big collapse in oil markets, even if Saudi Arabia and Russia had not engaged in this supply war that we saw in March. However, politically, and we can talk about this more, a lot of American politicians um, really focused in on Saudi Arabia as being the cause of this collapse. So it was almost the misfortune, or really I'd say the bad timing of Russia and Saudi Arabia to engage in this price war, um, because they ended up assuming a lot of the blame for something that was so much greater than any of their actions um, could have uh, portended. So um, that's on the cause. On the response, after a month of this, um, collapsing prices and Saudi Arabia and others pushing more oil onto the market, you got an agreement on April 12th. And this agreement was among OPEC members, um, plus Russia and a lot of non-OPEC members. And they agreed that they would cut their collective production by 10 million barrels of oil a day. So again, that's kind of bringing down, cutting 10% uh, of the world's oil production. And their intention was to try to help rebalance the markets. Now, let me just say two things about the significance of this deal. One, you know, in the past, we're all familiar with OPEC cutting production to raise prices. And even over the last few years, we've seen how OPEC has coordinated with Russia um, because that has been necessary to influence the oil markets. But what was so significant about this moment was that other players that normally are completely apart from these negotiations and normally are perceived to actually have interest to the opposite effect got involved. The most prominent voice um, in this overall negotiation was surprisingly President Donald Trump, who weighed in persistently, heavily, and aggressively with Vladimir Putin, with uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, really pushing them to come to a deal to cut production to boost prices. So this is interesting in a number of, for a number of reasons. In part, you know, President Trump has been historically allergic to OPEC, thinking of it as a nefarious organization up until quite recently, always calling on OPEC to actually produce more oil and bring down the price. But this time, the president, I think, 
um, with good reason, came to appreciate that actually these low prices were so low that they were hurting the American oil industry as well. So he engaged in this, people were calling him OPEC's number one negotiator um, to really bring the parties to a deal. But you also had other countries come forward that are outside these normal channels and say that they were going to make production cuts, that everyone was going to try to do their bit to restore some balance to the market. And I think that underscores how um, many consumers think of low oil prices as a good thing, but in this particular instance, we're talking about prices that are so low um, that they could have a massive impact on the overall stability of the global economy. And that is why you had so many players come together. I personally really thought this was an optimistic development um, in an otherwise pretty bleak, bleak landscape. And the reason for this is that what we saw was an unprecedented crisis um, that drew the response of an unprecedented coalition of actors. So it demonstrated to me what I hope we will see in many other sectors throughout the course of the next year as the world tries to respond to the COVID crisis, that when you get a new crisis, that you can actually get actors thinking fresh about the problem and cooperating across international lines to try to find a solution. So that's the first significance. I think geopolitically, there is a significance there. Um, in terms of what this agreement on April 12th did for oil markets, um, you know, people, I think in general, uh, were disappointed that it didn't seem to stem the tide of the price collapse. We actually saw that move to negative prices in the United States happen after the April 12th agreement. But I think for those who watched the oil markets closely, they were well aware that if you have a demand drop of 30 million barrels of oil a day and you get producers to cut their supply by 10, you still have an oversupply of 20 million barrels of oil a day, which is 20 million barrels of oil that is being produced every day um, that nobody wants to consume or store. And so this, this inevitably wasn't going to be a solution. It was going to be a contribution. And I think we will see that. We already have started to see this week that prices coming up a little bit as parts of the world's economy seems to be coming back online. So demand seems to be growing a little bit and supply is being cut by these producers. So, you know, that's a, a bit of a hopeful sign. Um, but again, this is a, a longer term problem. So just a word on what's next. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of different opinions out there. You can find experts who um, can give you, you know, lots of different answers to questions that you might think should be factual in nature. Um, I believe we're going to see a gradual rebalancing of the oil markets as demand comes back um, over time. And as we see more and more suppliers shut in production because of the low, low prices. So even over the last month, we've seen that the US, the United States has shut in or um, its overall oil production has declined by 1 million barrels of oil a day, just because companies have found it not economical to produce in this such a low oil price environment. Um, you know, in, in this case, a negative oil price environment. So you've, you, you've started to see companies bringing down their production. We're gonna continue to see that until prices get back up into the 50s or even the $60 a barrel. Um, and I think this is going to take quite a long time for there to be balance in the oil market because there are still huge inventories. Um, because of all this oversupply over the last uh, couple of months, basically, um, this is a, something to visualize, but basically every single storage unit in the world that could store oil is filled with oil now. And so with growing demand is going to have to eat away at the oversupply and eat away the inventories and that will take some time. I think the pace at which this normalcy is restored, if it is restored, we can talk about this, depends on two things, or there's two things I'm watching. One is um, the pace at which demand comes back. There's a big debate about this. You have um, many different reputable people and organizations say they think demand for oil will come back to 2019 levels by the end of this year. Um, I personally think it's going to take a lot longer than that. So much of the global oil demand depends on international air travel. I think it's going to be a, a longer period of time before we see that restored. There are some people who believe that the levels of demand for oil globally may never return to the place they were in 2019. 
Um, I, we can talk about my particular views, but I think it's, uh, they will come back to those levels, but it will probably take a year to two years to do so. The other variable I'm watching, which is a really big and important and interesting one that's beginning to get more attention, is the extent to which governments around the world, when they think about creating stimulus packages for the recovery in the post-COVID era, the extent to which they 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 build in to those um, packages things that hasten the energy transition, that kind of speed up the pace at which the world moves away from fossil fuels towards renewable and alternative energy. Certainly, this has been something that was of interest to many policymakers and many people for a long time, but there have been some obstacles that have been hard for societies to hurdle. And I'd say the United States is one of those societies, um, and that is infrastructure. So much of our country's infrastructure is based around the uses of fossil fuels. And a lot of that infrastructure is still valuable, it's still working. Um, and in order to suddenly render it obsolete, you'd have to be willing to absorb a big cost. Um, and people and generally haven't been willing to do that. So the question is, will the US Congress working with this administration, will they be forced, um, will they have the vision to say, when we make a big infrastructure stimulus program, we should do it with an eye to the kind of economy that we want to have in the future, not the one that we, we have just seen so much damage done to. So will they invest in infrastructure that will support a different kind of energy mix in the United States? And I think it's an open question. We can talk about the, 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 the various arguments in either direction. It's an open question. Um, but if it is done in that way, then I think the oil industry could be looking, um, could see a future that they had imagined was out there, but maybe 10, 20, even 30 years down the road, they could see that future really coming to the present much more quickly than anyone had anticipated. So I, I'm going to just say a few more words about the geopolitics of this before we get to questions. So um, obviously this has huge implications for companies and for countries. I want to point out four geopolitical implications and happy to go into them in greater detail or to hear from others on the call uh, their thoughts about this. The first um, one I would say I'm calling it US energy dominance. So the Trump administration had really focused on this actual phrase, energy dominance, and it's been a big part of what the Trump administration has talked about over the last several years when it talks about energy. It's talked about the fact that America really is, has become over the last 10 years really, um, an energy superpower. So um, let's just look at before this COVID crisis, the United States was the largest producer of oil in the world, larger than Russia, larger than Saudi Arabia, the largest producer of natural gas in the world, larger than Russia, certainly far larger than Saudi Arabia. Um, it was a significant exporter of oil and a significant, actually the third largest um, in the world, exporter of liquefied natural gas. So that this huge boom, which is um, largely attributable to new technologies that we know as fracking over the last 10 years or so has produced this real American energy renaissance. So um, you really, we moved into a situation where just recently America, for the first time in decades, became a net exporter of oil, meaning that essentially um, it is producing more oil than, um, than it is cons uh, that is uh, importing. And so that was a significant step. And the Trump administration really played that up um, as having a lot of strategic significance for the United States. So there is a question about how does this new oil environment affect America's energy dominance? And um, I'll try to be very brief here because there are a, there are a lot of interesting wrinkles to this. I would say, in short, there's no question that when you hear people today talking about how this low oil price environment, this oil collapse, is bad for American oil industry, there's no question about that. This is very painful. It already has been painful. It will continue to be painful for many, many of America's thousands of particularly small producers. 
Um, in many respects, we're going to see a lot of bankruptcies among companies that um, are very small and uh, well, not even very small, I guess it depends on your definition of small, but small, relatively smaller companies, um, smaller producers, many of whom were actually probably having financial difficulties before this oil price collapse, or at least having difficulties attracting investors. Um, a lot of these companies are not going to be viable in this environment. It's just going to be too difficult uh, a price environment for them to keep producing. Now this um, some people say like, well, I don't really feel sorry for oil producers. That's the view of many people. And I would say on the one hand, um, certainly, you know, people are entitled to that view. But I think having a, a perspective about what these companies mean for the economy is, is useful to know that um, you, have, you have tens or hundreds of thousands of people employed in the oil industry in the United States. And indirectly, there are 11 million Americans who make their living based on the oil industry. So this will have an effect on unemployment numbers. Um, we've already seen that, I'm sure, in the many numbers that we're seeing come out um, every week or so. It also has an effect on the revenues of states that get uh, significant taxes from these industries and the federal government revenues. So on the one hand, um, you know, there is an impact on the American oil industry, um, and that does have an impact on America overall. But I would say the big picture is that this situation that we're seeing is not going to crater the U.S. oil industry. Um, some people are hoping for that. Some people are fearful of that. The reality is that even under pretty severe scenarios, American production will decline, but America will still be close or at the, the production level of being the largest producer in the oil, of oil in the world. Um, and that it will, there's no scenario that I foresee that America will go back to a situation where it is importing so much of its oil consumption. In 2006, in a net basis, the U.S. imported about two-thirds of every, two-thirds of every barrel of oil it consumed. This was down to less than 5% before this crisis. That number will go up a bit, but it's not going to go anywhere near to two-thirds. Um, America is still going to have a very robust oil industry, but it is going to look different. It's going to be peppered with a lot more, with much bigger companies, fewer smaller companies. Um, and, you know, depending on your perspective, that can be a good thing if they're more efficient producers. It can be a bad thing if you had been employed by these smaller companies. Um, so I think, you know, there's still a strong argument that America is going to have a lot of energy influence in the markets. Um, and I'm of the view, we can talk about this, I'm of the view that um, America never had energy independence in the sense it never was free from the vagaries of the global oil market. America has been tied to the global oil market over the last 10 years more tightly than it ever has been. And what this whole uh, crisis has demonstrated to us was how when something happens in another part of the world, that affects our energy industry as much as we would be affected and our economy if we were consuming oil from other parts of the world. So the real vulnerability comes from being connected to the global market and that's not likely to change. And, and I'll, I'll speed up with these last three. There's also, I would say geopolitically, some real implications of this crisis for the relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia. I began by talking about the supply shock and the demand shock. And part of the reason I think that's important because as I mentioned, there's this perception that Saudi Arabia created this crisis. Um, and hasn't done enough to fix the crisis. I think that, um, that the reality is this crisis is about COVID-19. It's about the demand destruction that comes from this pandemic. Um, the Saudis didn't play a useful role at the beginning. They have taken steps to try to mitigate it. Um, but this shouldn't be something that is blamed on the Saudis or th that the Saudis are expected to fix unilaterally. Um, again, I gave you the number of 30 million barrels of oil a day demand drop. Saudi Arabia, you know, if it's only producing eight and a half million barrels of oil a day today, even if it stopped production altogether, it couldn't solve the problem. But I think a lot of our lawmakers um, have decided to focus on Saudi Arabia. And so this is an example of how Saudi Arabia is not a reliable partner. And the relationship between Saudi Arabia and the United States was rocky anyway, particularly on the congressional side. 
uh, before this COVID-19 crisis. And so I think it's certainly possible um, that when other issues come before Congress, um, that there will be fewer defenders of Saudi Arabia in the congressional uh, body and that we could see more implications for the bilateral relationship, whether it's in arms sales, whether it's in economics, politics, diplomacy. The third implication I wanted to mention was just, I think it's fairly obvious, but it's worth mentioning because it will be long lasting. There are many oil producers around the world who rely on oil revenues for huge portions of their, um, of their budget, for funding their budget. Um, I'll give you the example of Iraq, both because it's an important country to the United States and because it is, has some of the most dire, it's one of the countries that's already in a dire situation because of this oil market collapse. So Iraq's government budget is funded, um, more than 90% of it is funded by oil revenues. And oil revenues have gone down dramatically. They're at a, a, a all time low for a decade. Um, and the government finds that it is no longer has enough revenue to even pay the workers in the public sector in Iraq, never mind fund health, education, or security budgets. Um, and so this has been very fast and immediate. And this isn't a country that even before the COVID crisis was having pretty serious political economic and security problems. In fact, uh, Iraq just had a new government uh, sworn in yesterday um, after many, many months of effectively not having a permanent government. And Iraq, of course, is still fighting, fighting the specter of ISIS and the possibility that ISIS tries to make a resurgence in its country. So you add onto that political and security instability, you add this massive economic instability and you don't have to have a lot of imagination to think about what that could mean for the country itself and for the region. And you know, if we went around the world, if we had time to do that, we would look at countries from Algeria to Angola, to Oman, to Venezuela, to Ecuador. I mean, all of these countries are suddenly in very dire straits. Um, there is no oil producer, no large oil producer in the world that can be profitable um, and whose budget allows it to be met in full when the price of oil is below $40 a barrel. And again, at least this morning, it was 28. So, you know, we're talking about a whole swath of countries, um, including Nigeria, you know, the most popular uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa that are facing really dramatic fiscal crises that could well translate into security and political crises. And the last thing I'll just mention uh, very briefly um, is that this, this crisis, I believe, will have implications for Russia's role in the Middle East. You know, Russia over the last five or so years went from being a real per peripheral actor in the Middle East. Essentially, uh, Russia, well, then the Soviet Union was kind of squeezed out of the Middle East in the 1970s after the 1973 war and um, hadn't been able to gain a foothold in that part of the world until the last five years or so. And in the last five years, Russia partially um, you know, partially benefiting from the perception and in some cases the reality that the United States was withdrawing from the Middle East, Russia kind of came in and um, sought and achieved an enhanced role when it came to security, when it came to economics, when it came to politics. Um, you know, my most recent trip to the Middle East was uh, right before the COVID crisis occurred or six weeks before. And um, so back around the end of December, and you know, I would hear from people that Russia was the only actor and Putin the only player that everyone in the Middle East would sit down with, from Israel to Iran. Um, I do think that this crisis that I mentioned at the beginning, this uh, spat between Russia and Saudi Arabia, um, will leave a lasting bad taste in the mouth of many Arab governments who are going to look at Russia and say, wow, our relationship with Russia really wasn't strategic in nature. It was opportunistic. Um, and that we just have to take that for what it is, which doesn't mean there's no role for Russia in the Middle East. But you know, any talk that Russia is going to be the new strategic partner of this part of the world, I think is um, going to dissipate quite quickly. So with that, um, I, I want to turn it back to Mary and um, hope that I've sparked at least um, some 
thoughts and ideas. And again, I welcome questions, but I also welcome uh, other perspectives. It's a pleasure to hear if people are thinking about problems differently as well. So thank you. Hey, thank you so much for that uh, tour de crisis or tour de crises. Um, I'm wondering, I'm gonna take advantage of um, where I'm sitting, uh, if we could go back a step farther. Um, you know, we talk about the, um, uh, the supply shock and then the demand shock and, and uh, how refreshing to see them put into such clear perspective. But that supply shock, um, many people are, are talking about how that was really um, originated with the U.S. investing so heavily in, in fracking. And um, you alluded to that as well. But is, is that even a profitable business for us to be in? Um, is fracking is is not um, by some measures is is not particularly efficient. Uh, many of the companies that uh, do it, not even speaking of the environmental uh, consequences, are highly highly leveraged. Um, this is not a good time in global history to be highly leveraged. Uh, so, is this energy dominance um, even desirable if it's really built on on the back of 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 this practice? And do you think that there's credibility to the notion that, in fact, uh, Saudi and Russia were getting together to, to push us out of, of that business to uh, diminish our, uh, the U.S. market share? Great. Um, great That's question. a lot of questions. <laughs> a lot of, no, there's a lot in there, and it's really uh, rich um, in substance. So let me just kind of respond to two pieces of what you were saying. First, is this a business that the United States should be in from an efficiency you know, perspective. Does this make sense? And I would say, and I, uh, I mentioned this in my, my comments, but I'll, I'll repeat it a little bit here. Um, there's no question that there are uh, certain companies, as you mentioned, ones that are highly leveraged, um, that are not the most efficient producers, that may not have the best acreage, um, that had high break-even costs of production, and that those, I, th I think the future of those companies was in question even before this whole crisis. You know, those companies were finding it hard to attract investment, um, you know, partially because of the whole movement, um, in the investor movement being more uh, environmentally sustainable and aware, a lot of questions about where the future of the oil industry was in any case. I think that a lot of those companies um, and I say this and I feel, you know, heartless and I say this at a high level while I realize this affects individuals in many respects, but I think a lot of those companies, uh, the fact that they will either get folded into other larger companies or may declare bankrupt um, is, is not, uh, you know, it's not, it, it, it's something that that's what happens in a business cycle, right? This is something that does make sense from an economic perspective. Um, so. Um, but I would also point out that there are a lot of companies that are larger, either larger independents or majors that are engaged in production of oil coming from shale that is very efficient, um, that contributes a lot to the U.S. economy, to our strategic position and also our economy. And a lot of those companies, um, they initially were very reticent about getting into shale because it just looked, it just looked like too labor intensive, um, it just looked, the business model for shale is very different than it is for kind of conventional oil. And it wasn't appealing to the majors for a whole range of reasons. But we've seen in the last few years that a lot of these companies, you know, the Exxons, the Chevrons, the BPs have become more interested in shale, which is the type of resource that requires fracking. And they've been able to do it. They've been able to do it more efficiently. Um, and I think that that will remain for sure. Um, on the second part of your question, you know, is there any credence to the idea that Saudi Arabia and Russia were trying to damage the US oil industry? And I would say, um, I'd like to go back very briefly to the last oil price collapse, which was in 2014, wasn't as severe as this one, but that one came about because essentially you had this new industry in the United States producing so much new oil that we were in another situation of oversupply. And instead of cutting production to boost price, as people thought OPEC would do, Saudi Arabia decided we're going to produce more. Um, and the thinking there at the time was, well, this will bring down the price of oil to somewhere that's manageable for us. 
but will essentially put a lot of these American producers out of business and it will, it will you know, shrink the global supply in a way that's more sustainable for everybody. They made a big miscalculation in part because this was totally unchartered territory. They thought the price just had to drop to $80 to get a lot of those shale producers out of business. In fact, you know, the price had ended up dropping to $29 a barrel. Um, and it took a long time for a lot of the less efficient shale producers to get out of the picture. So the Saudis, I think, over that period between 2016 and today, really came to um, believe that, yeah, it would be great if we could slow down the growth in American shale production. Because keep in mind, America um, is and was producing more oil than Saudi Arabia, more oil than Russia. And so there's no question that Russia and Saudi Arabia probably thought, it'd be good to slow that down. Um, but I don't subscribe to the view, which I know is popular, that that was their primary goal, was to destroy the American oil industry. I mean, we had uh, congressional members publicly use language like economic warfare by the Russians and the Saudis against the United States. And I think um, that that is is putting, you know, it, it's, 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 um, it makes us guilty of something that Americans are often guilty of, where we think everything is all about us. Um, that in fact, like this, they were doing, you know, what made sense for them in a price environment where, uh, you know, this was about existential things for them. It was about, you know, life or death. And these were the steps they had to take that they thought were going to put themselves in a financially sustainable position. And if it meant that it was bad for American shale, that probably was okay from their perspective, but that doesn't mean that was the primary impetus of the action. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, I have many questions for you, but I realize that um, many others of us have questions too. So we're gonna go to um, a couple of our live questions. Um, so, uh, attendees, uh, when I call on you, it's going to take a minute uh, for us to get you on camera and get your mic. So hang on until that is the case. Uh, Rene Bezerra has a question. Raise your hand. I was curious to know, what is your opinion about the immediate impact of the, in the, on the oil industry? What will that mean for the renewable energy, energy industry you know, right away? You sort of alluded to the long-term impact, perhaps through uh, infrastructure bill that may come up and how that may benefit the renewable industry, but how does that impact uh, at the immediate time? Sure. Um, I would say, you know, most immediately, uh, you know, with this decrease that there's been a decrease in demand for oil, which is what I focused on, but there's also been a decrease in demand for energy, generally speaking. So I think the most immediate um, impact is probably negative on renewable energies, just because it's negative on energy as a whole. So not specifically targeting those, um, those industries, but just that reality that demand is down across the board. There's, um, then I would say there's kind of a short-term question. That's immediate, a short-term question, which I think falls into the time frame you might be asking about, is um, you know, just to what extent do people, as they look at the economic situation um, and in the United States and elsewhere, to what extent um, do people feel like the priority needs to be just on getting the economy going again, getting people back to work, and that is what is the big driver of things. And to what extent are people still uh, really seized with the importance of the energy transition and clean energy and using renewable energy and that type of thing? So I think there's a short-term question about that. Um, and we don't yet know where people are going to come out on that. I think it's plausible in the short term, in the immediate term, that the focus will be on just getting people back to work. Um, and the easiest way to do that is to use existing, I mean, keep in mind that 81% of the, the energy that the world consumes every day is fossil fuels, 81%. So, you know, if you're trying to stoke an economy, um, it's easier to do that with fossil fuels. So I think that will be the initial impulse. Although, as I said, I'm more hopeful that over the longer period of time, we can be a bit more strategic. The last thing I'd say, and this is another note of optimism, is that a lot of people look at uh, 20, 2008 and 2009 and the recovery coming out of the financial crisis, and they say, well, you know, we had an opportunity to do there, to do more for clean energy, and we did do some, but it wasn't really as significant as it might have been. 
And you know, I, I agree with that, but I, I point out that that doesn't have to be a roadmap for us now because the, the financials of renewable energy are so much better than they were in 2008 and 2009. I mean, literally the, com the competitiveness of solar and wind has increased dramatically, dramatically since 2008 and 2009, that these are energy sources, which are now in some places competitive with fossil fuels. That was not the case in 2008 and 2009. So I think there is a much stronger case to be made that those energy sources um, should get a boost coming out of this economic downturn. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a number of questions that um, may ask you to prognosticate in a way that you don't want to about prices. Um, so, for example, uh, uh, we, we actually have uh, someone here in Boston, uh, Mike Charlin, who wants to know uh, what will the Brent and WTI uh, ranges be over the next 24 months? Um, do you have a crystal ball? Um, so I once had someone say to me, and this I think is a famous quote, um, certainly not mine, but you know, either predict a price or a time frame, but never both. Um, <laughs> so that's a, an easy way. And I, I mean, I, I won't pretend that I have a, a crystal ball at all. I'll give you some um, some sense of, of where I think things might go. I, I, I would say, you know, looking over the rest of this year, I expect prices to remain quite low. Um, and when I say quite low, I'm talking under $50. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, as I said, I do expect there'll be a gradual rebalancing, but this will be slow, I think, because I think demand is going to be slow to come back um, in full force. And because there is such a big supply overhang. So, you know, my sense is that in the next year, we're looking at uh, certainly through the rest of this year, but probably well into 2021, we're looking at prices that probably don't exceed $50 a barrel. Um, there is a scenario that I think is worth thinking about because it's certainly in the realm of the plausible and it could be very disruptive. Um, and that is a scenario in which demand comes back uh, even more aggressively than people thought, um, but it comes back faster than supply uh, returns. So we've got these two things going on. We've had this huge drop in demand and we've had a slower but a really steady drop in supply as suppliers shut in supply and significantly as suppliers are stopping making investments. So we've seen companies make huge cuts in the capital expenditure that they're anticipating to do for the rest of this year and for subsequent years. Sure. And so that means the supply is going to continue to shrink, demand is going to continue to grow, and there's certainly the, the possibility that we find ourselves at a, 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 a spot where there's more demand than there is supply. So we're kind of in the reverse situation. And that could re lead, at least in a, a short-term sense, to some much higher prices. Um, and, and that, you know, would have its own geopolitical implications. What would happen in that environment is that you'd actually probably see American shale um, have a pretty quick uptick because it is the supply, um, you, you'd have suppliers like Saudi Arabia and others who are actually able to bring new supply to market quickly, but those are relatively few and far between. Um, so you would get more American supply come online, but that takes probably about six months or so. So you would have, you know, a period six months um, or maybe a little bit more, where you could see much higher oil prices because of this, this imbalance, imbalance between, between supply and okay. demand. Okay, great. So uh, we do have Peter, he's just not going to be on video. So uh, I think we can bring Peter in just on audio to ask his question. Peter, are you with us? We're all having fun with technology these days. So, unfortunately, um, now he did send in a question. I think it's a slightly different one, so I'll just read that one because um, I don't think we're going to get him on audio. Uh, earlier, he wrote in um, wondering how much, uh, it's related to what you're talking about, how much empty space is there in um, the U.S. strategic oil reserve? Um, should we fill it up, um, or is it just a sort of conceptual thing? And at what bargain price? At what at, at what price do we stop um, shunting excess excess oil into um, the reserve? 
Great. Um, so as for those who may know a little less than Peter about this, the, the United States has a very significant size strategic petroleum reserve um, that it, it brought about in the 1970s, which is basically to hold a lot of oil um, under the ground in these enormous salt tanks off the Gulf Coast for a situation where perhaps there's this enormous spike in prices where the American market needs to be um, more supplied to bring about some element of price stability. It's interesting because it's been a subject of pol public policy debate over the last few years as um, up until this COVID-19 crisis, you had a lot of policymakers say, you know, do we really need this anymore? Now that we're such a big producer ourselves and we're not so vulnerable to the rest of the world, do we really need this? And in the past few years, you actually saw Congress selling off parts of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in order to you know, create revenue streams. Now, this, as Peter suggested, has come back into the limelight um, for a couple of reasons in the last few weeks. So as he suggested, the, the Trump administration said, well, one of the things we could do to help um, our many struggling oil producers is that the United States government could buy um, oil and restock this uh, strategic petroleum reserve. And this, um, it, I'll give you my view on this, this is a smart thing to do uh, at such low prices. Essentially, you're rebuilding America's strategic supply um, at bargain basement prices. And it has the advantage of, um, of helping out a little bit in terms of increasing demand for that oil. Um, China has been doing the same as well and, and probably other countries that hold strategic stocks. You know, you think like this is a good time to buy and increase your strategic stock for a time in the future where prices may be much higher. Um, this, this, so I think it's a good policy. There's significant room, I, well, I'd say there's significant room if we just look at absolute numbers. But in terms of is there enough to really make a difference in this supply moment, I would say no. That there's just essentially limitations on how much oil, logistic limitations, can be bought and transferred to the strategic supply every day. So while it might make a, uh, might make a little bit of a, a help in the boost for demand, it's not going to um, create any real significant cushion. The last thing I would say that's important to note was that while President Trump asked for money for this purpose, Congress did not allocate it to him. And so I think that's significant because um, essentially it is a little bit, um, I hope not, but I think likely, a little bit of a view into the very different perspectives that the Trump administration and Congress are going to have about how to handle energy in um, this whole effort to restart the economy and rebuild the economy. That essentially I think Congress is not going to be that interested in doing things to help oil and that the Trump administration is going to be mostly interested in doing things that help oil. And the reality is we need to have a perspective that looks at the whole energy train um, chain and thinks about what needs to be done to um, ensure stability and environmental stability over the long run. Um, and you know, that will require some help for the oil industry at some points in time, but probably more help for uh, an environmentally sustainable energy system over time. So I think you know, the fact that Congress, even though I think it's a very sensible idea, um, Congress was not interested in funding it is an indication that this is going to be um, a point of contention. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think this may be our last question. Um, Elaine Wu has been waiting patiently with her hand up. So uh, we'll move Elaine into a mic and, and a camera. Elaine, are you with us? Hey, can you hear me? Uh, we'll just, yeah, so we'll listen to you. Speak right up. Yeah, okay. thank you so much for your brilliant speech. So I just have one question. So what if Putin will now Will not be their next president. So, how do you think about Russia, Russia's position in their world 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 market? I'm sorry. Um, what if who will not be the next president? And um, Putin. I mean, the president. Oh. The, yeah, the president of Russia. What if he won't be the next president? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so there, there of course is, um, you know, Putin, I believe his term runs out in 2024. That's when his presidency would be over. And right before this whole COVID crisis hit, I mean, literally, we're talking the beginning of March, um, he basically proposed a set of changes to the Russian political system that require a constitutional amendment that wouldn't exactly allow him to be president for longer, but would essentially uh, uh, you know, change the structures of the system such that he could continue to hold enormous um, power if he, uh, you know, in, in a different position or a presidential-like position where more power was devolved to other bodies. So um, I think the sense of many of us before the COVID crisis was that he was positioning himself to effectively wield presidential type power for the foreseeable future. Um, now, there are two questions related to what Elaine asked. I, I'd say one, um, so what if, you know, what if this whole crisis changes um, the appetite for the Russian people for another decade of, of Putin in some fashion? And I think that's plausible because, you know, we're seeing that Russia is actually facing its own pretty serious COVID-19 crisis. And I think there was a sense early on that Russia was going to avoid it, but now it seems clear that Russia it has a pretty serious health crisis of its own. So that is going to be a real challenge for Putin and his government. And this is going to be on top of a huge economic challenge because Russia, while not as dependent on oil revenues as, say, Saudi Arabia or Iraq, is heavily dependent on oil revenues. It's it's a and and, and natural gas revenues. This is a major part of the the Russian economy. And so um, the Russians are going to, they're looking at, um, probably they were looking at an economic recession if you just looked at oil prices, but if you put the COVID-19 um, and the quarantines on top of it, you know, there's going to be real economic problems in Russia. So it's conceivable that um, these plans will be put on the shelf or not approved and that uh, Putin won't be president. Um, you know, there's always the possibility that Putin is no longer with us. You know, this is the thing that I think is um, the most destabilizing uh, scenario for Russia is the fact, what if something happens to him? You know, he's not, he's not an old guy, but he's not a young guy. Um, and the whole system is really built on Vladimir Putin. And so to your question, what if he's no longer president? I think the first thing is, under what circumstances is he no longer president? Does he step down? Is there some transition? Um, in which case, you know, I think things might be able to be managed. Is it um, a moment where something happens to him and he's no longer able to govern or he dies? Um, I think this could catalyze a major crisis in the Russian system um, as people, you know, vie for power um, in a system that has been so dramatically consolidated around Vladimir Putin. Okay, uh, so sticking with the uh geopolitical implications for just a moment as, as we wrap up. First of all, I have to commend to everybody um, uh, Dr. O'Sullivan's piece in Bloomberg, April 29th, uh, which really is um, uh, kind of mind-blowing, short four pages. Um, you talk about um, uh, the risk of failed states and uh, what, what that means to U.S. security. So, you know, Russia, amazing to believe, but they're relatively diversified. Mexico is relatively diversified. Certainly the U.S. is. Um, but we have some real ongoing problem situations, for example, in Iran and Venezuela. And I wonder if you could uh, just comment kind of beyond just the energy situation on the geopolitical risk um, that we're looking at as a result of this collapse. Sure, and I mentioned it a little bit, I talked in the context of Iraq, but Iraq is sort of emblematic of the kinds of challenges that other countries are gonna deal with. So you've got you know, dozens of countries that are going to deal with this in some fashion. So um, you mentioned Iran and Venezuela, and those are two countries that until recently, meaning in the last several years, were um, among the world's largest oil producers. 
because of sanctions, because of economic uh, mismanagement, particularly in the case of Venezuela, both of these countries are um, producing and exporting very, very little oil these days. So in some respect, they're, um, they're having their own dramatic crises, especially in Venezuela, which is really on the precipice of a major humanitarian disaster in my mind. Um, and the low oil price might exacerbate it, but like the, they weren't exporting much oil anyway. Um, so in some sense, it's not going to be as hard a, a hit on them. But there are other countries and one that probably no one thinks of, um, but is, is Ecuador, a country like Ecuador, which apparently is really struggling with its COVID situation also um, is heavily, heavily dependent on its oil revenues to fund its budget. So I do think that when we look across the world, it's not just countries in the Middle East uh, that are going to be affected by this oil price collapse. And of course, you know, this happens to state the obvious, but the very important, it happens at a time when um, countries are, many countries will and are being faced with enormous challenges on the health front. So I think it's a real, um, it's a real moment for uh, international cooperation and international leadership um, because a, a lot of what happens in these countries is not going to be just contained in those countries. So, you know, what's happening in Venezuela, a lot of reasons for it, um, but it has the potential to, uh, and already has begun to, I would say, really destabilize the entire continent of Latin America. Right. Okay, so we have a million you have been very generous with your time. You need to go. Um, I wish that we could all give you a you know, room full of applause, uh, Dr. O'Sullivan, for your very interesting comments. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, Zooming in wherever you may be. And uh, please do check out the rest of the um, World Affairs Council National Summit this week. And also, please do get in touch with uh, worldboston.org to see what we've got going on here for you virtually in Boston as we ride out this super isolated, super global moment together. Again, Dr. Sullivan. Have a Thank great day, you. everyone. Thank you. I've enjoyed speaking with all of you. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. Nice.